The process of photosynthesis is a process in which plants, in particular the green leaves of plants, can produce sugar using simple starting materials in their environment. The two basic ingredients to make sugar are carbon dioxide, which has one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. There are double bonds between the carbon and the oxygen atoms. And then water, here we have one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms in one water molecule. And sugar, glucose, is this molecule over here. C6H12O6. Six carbon atoms, the black ones, 12 hydrogen atoms, the white ones, and six oxygen atoms, the blue ones. The process of photosynthesis also produces oxygen gas as a waste product. Notice the double bonds between the two oxygen atoms. So again, in general, Plants are going to use these two simple starting materials, carbon dioxide and water, to build sugar. That's the goal of photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide enters the plant through small openings on the underside of leaves called stomata. So carbon dioxide from the air can enter the plant through stomata. Of course, the roots of the plant are responsible for delivering water molecules up from the roots, up the stem, and into the cells of the leaf. It's in the leaf then where special molecules called chlorophyll molecules cover the surface of chloroplasts and this is a vial of chlorophyll in alcohol. So we took a leaf and we boiled it and extracted out the chlorophyll. This molecule, chlorophyll, has certain properties when it interacts with light. It reflects green light, and that's why we see leaves as green. However, chlorophyll also absorbs the red and the blue light, and that's the energy that the plant will be capturing to power the process of photosynthesis. So if we think about the starting materials again, these two kinds of molecules, carbon dioxide and water, uh, provide the necessary atoms to build sugar over here. But obviously the atoms are arranged differently in a sugar molecule than they are over here in the starting materials. So the plant has to rearrange the atoms of the starting materials to make the final product, glucose. But the atoms in the starting materials are strongly bonded together. There are chemical bonds that are keeping these atoms together in this carbon dioxide molecule, for example. It takes energy to break these chemical bonds so that the atoms can be uh, liberated and then rearranged to form glucose. The energy to break these chemical bonds, then, is where sunlight comes in. The chlorophyll molecules inside the leaf cells, in particular on the chloroplasts, the chlorophyll molecules are going to absorb the red and the blue light. Recall the white light has all the colors of the spectrum and the chlorophyll then absorbs the reds and the blues principally, reflecting the greens and the yellows. That's the energy that is required to break these chemical bonds and reassemble the atoms of carbon dioxide and water into uh, glucose. Now let's get a little bit more specific. The carbon in carbon dioxide is the carbon that ends up in glucose. The hydrogen of water is the hydrogen that ends up in glucose. And we can see that must be the case because carbon dioxide is the only source of carbon and water is the only source of hydrogen to make the final product glucose. The oxygen atoms in glucose, however, could theoretically come free from either of the starting materials. They both have oxygen. Researchers did experiments in which they uh, made some of these starting materials with radioactive oxygen atoms. So for example, you can, in a sense, 
provide a plant with carbon dioxide that has radioactive oxygen atoms in it. And this will allow scientists then to follow, to trace where the radioactive oxygen atoms end up. Do they end up in the glucose or do they end up being released by the plant as waste? Well, when you make uh, the oxygen atoms of carbon dioxide radioactive, when you, in a sense, tag them so we can follow them, you find that the, glu the glucose has radioactive oxygens in it. And the oxygen liberated by the plant is not radioactive. On the other hand, when you make water molecules with radioactive oxygen atoms, you find that the glucose has no radioactive oxygen atoms, and the released oxygen is radioactive. So what this tells us is that the oxygen in glucose is coming from carbon dioxide. The oxygen in water molecules is released as waste. So plants use sunlight energy to build glu glucose, and they need the energy to break the chemical bonds of the starting materials and rearrange those atoms to form the sugar. In particular, the energy uh, of this process is used to split water molecules to provide that source of hydrogen and oxygen is liberated as a waste. And then uh, further energy is necessary to take the uh, atoms of carbon dioxide break these uh, bonds between the atoms and, and take those atoms and rearrange them uh, to form glucose. The oxygen released by photosynthesis, of course, is necessary for animals to breathe, but plants don't release this oxygen for the benefit of animals. This oxygen is a waste product in this complicated process called photosynthesis. Now, it turns out, though, that like animal cells, plant cells also need some oxygen. They need oxygen because once they've made their glu glucose, the sugar, they're going to turn around and burn it to metabolize it, to break it down to get energy. So the process of photosynthesis builds sugar inside chloroplasts, and then the plant cell is going to break down the sugar to get energy. It's like making your lunch and then eating it. The breakdown of sugar always requires oxygen, just as in animal cells. For thousands of years, people believed that new plant tissue came from the soil. As plants grew, they converted soil into leaves and stems. In Aristotle's time, farmers complained that over, the, over time, their crop production would decrease as if plants were using up the soil. It wasn't until the 1600s that somebody decided to put that idea to the test. His name was Van Helmont. He did a simple experiment. He took a five pound plant and potted it in 200 pounds of soil. After five years of regular watering, he simply measured the weight of the plant and the soil again he found that the plant had gained 165 pounds and the soil had lost two ounces. Van Helmont concluded that soil was not being used as a major factor in building new plant tissue. Rather, new plant tissue came from water. Now we can celebrate Van Helmont for his experimental approach but he neglected to go farther to test whether water alone was being used by the plant. Perhaps the plant uses water and something else. Stephen Hales did a similar experiment as Van Helmont did, except he used water instead of soil. So he got a plant, one that would be able to grow just in water alone. He measured the weight of the plant and the weight of the water initially allowed the plant to grow, measured the weight of the new plant material, and measured how much water was used, the weight of the water that was missing. If plants 
converted 100% of the water into new tissue, then the weight of the new plant gained should be equal to the weight of the lost water. What Hales found was that the plant gained more weight than the water that was used. He concluded that plants must use something in addition to water. Perhaps that something was the substance in the air. To confirm that plants were absorbing something from the air, Hales had to set up a, a chamber like this. He had a pan of water, took a jar with an open end at the bottom, so it's an inverted jar, it's resting in the water. Now to understand Hales' result, we need to understand a little bit about air pressure. Right now, air molecules are bouncing around into each other and into the jar and into the surface of the water. As air molecules bounce into water molecules, it's exer exerting a force on the uh, on the water molecules, pushing them down. The force of air pressure on the surface of the water here will tend to push the water up inside the jar. But if we had just put the jar down like this, there's also, of course, air inside the jar. And so there are air molecules bouncing around inside, also pushing down on the water. So the level of the water inside the jar is going to depend on the pressure difference outside compared to inside. If we remove air from inside the vessel with a vacuum pump, then there are fewer molecules bouncing around, exerting force on the water inside. With less air pressure inside, the outside air pressure can push the water farther up the jar. If we inject air into the chamber, there's greater air pressure inside, and that greater air pressure will push the water down inside the vessel, and the water outside in the pan will go up. Incidentally, when you remove all the air from a chamber like this, you have effectively made a barometer, a device that measures air pressure. The height of the column of water, um, the weight of that column, is a measure of the atmospheric air pressure. When atmospheric air pressure increases, that increased pressure can push the column of water, or mercury, as is often used, higher into the chamber. So, what Hales did one was then have a uh, chamber like this, inverted chamber, in a pan of water. He then placed a plant inside the chamber. And to simulate that, we'll just take a piece of this. Okay, so after several days, he uh, watched what happened to the water level inside the jar. What he noticed was that the water level rose inside the jar. Now, one could say, well, maybe the outside air pressure increased, and this pushed the water up higher into the jar. Well, like a good scientist, Hales had a control condition, a jar with no plant in it. And that water level stayed the same. So the increase in water level inside the jar, Hales interpreted this as the result of something the plant was doing to the air pressure inside the chamber. Now if we think about why water level would go up, if the outside air pressure remained the same, what must have been happening was the inside air pressure was changing, was being reduced. With less inside air pressure, the outside air pressure could push the water a little bit higher. So the plant was somehow reducing the air pressure, Hales concluded. And that's exactly what would be happening, he thought, if the plant were absorbing something from the air. So for Hales, this confirmed that plants not only use water to build new tissue, but also are absorbing something from the air. When chemists began to chemically analyze uh, the uh, materials uh, in plants, they found a lot of carbon, especially in the form of glucose, carbon-rich molecule. Now, if we think about where a plant is getting carbon from, it was long known that plants require water. 
to survive. But as we can see here, water does not have carbon atoms. So water cannot be the only starting material to build new plant tissue. If plants have carbon and water does not have carbon, there must be something else with carbon that the plant is using. Hales directed our attention to something in the air. And later on, chemists discovered that air is a mixture of gases, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide. And so this now sort of uh, brought the pieces together. Plants are absorbing something from the air. That's something we suspect has carbon in it, and there is, in fact, carbon dioxide in the air. So if carbon dioxide were to enter a plant, it would be a source of carbon to build sugar. Scientists have discovered small openings on the underside of leaves. They're called stomata. And uh, initially, they wondered then, perhaps these openings were the sites of entry for carbon dioxide. A guy by the name of Julius Sachs performed a simple experiment. If carbon dioxide was really entering the leaves through these openings, and carbon dioxide is necessary to build sugar, then if you block these openings, the plant should not be able to build sugar. Julius Sachs covered the bottoms of leaves with wax to try and plug up the stomata. And in fact, he found that such leaves could not build sugar. And that supported the hypothesis that carbon dioxide enters the leaf through stomata. If you block carbon dioxide entry, the plant cannot make sugar. It's lacking its source of carbon. Another piece of the puzzle for how plants grow uh, was uh, contributed by a guy by the name of Ingenhaus. And he set up a chamber like this. This is an aquatic plant down here in a chamber of water. And this test tube here was initially filled with water and put on top of this dome uh, that the plant is in. So any gases that the plant produces can be collected in this tube and analyzed. What Ingenhaus found was that the green parts of plants produce some carbon dioxide but a lot of oxygen. And this only happened when light was shining on the, the plant. So Ingenhaus discovered that light shining on the green parts of plant cause the green parts to produce a lot of oxygen. Without the light, the green parts only produced small levels of carbon dioxide gas. He also analyzed the parts of plants that are non-green. So he put the stems and the roots and the uh, seeds, the non-green parts of plants, in a similar chamber and measured the gas production. What he found was that the non-green parts of plants only produced carbon dioxide. They did not produce oxygen. And it did not matter, matter whether light was shining on them or not. So Ingenhaus then found that all parts of the plant produce carbon dioxide. And only the green parts produce oxygen and only when they are exposed to light. We now know that all plant parts are producing carbon dioxide because they are burning sugar. The sugar that they make during photosynthesis is being used as a chemical energy source. As it is burned, oxygen is required to burn the sugar, but when the sugar is burned, carbon dioxide is again produced as well as water. Whenever we burn sugar, we produce carbon dioxide and water as waste. And this would explain then why it is that all plant parts are producing some carbon dioxide because they are burning sugar. The amazing things that plants can do is plants can build sugar. 
and they build sugar by this process called photosynthesis. This overview of photosynthesis is that plants harness solar energy to take um, the overview of photosynthesis is as follows. Plants can convert solar energy into chemical energy in the form of glucose. They build glucose from simple starting materials in their environment. Carbon dioxide enters the plant through stomata. Water enters the plant through the roots. Both are delivered to the leaf cells. In the leaf cells, specifically in the chloroplasts, a molecule called chlorophyll captures light and uses that captured energy to break the chemical bonds of the starting materials so the atoms can be rearranged to form sugar, glucose. In the process, oxygen is liberated as a waste material. However, it's only a waste material of the photosynthesis process, which is again the building of sugar. Because this oxygen, while much of it is produced and much of it leaves the plant to go out into the atmosphere, some of this oxygen is necessary for the plant to be able to burn the sugar that it just made. So plants build sugar by photosynthesis and then they burn the sugar that they just created. This is why the green parts of plants produce two kinds of gases. Some carbon dioxide as they are burning the sugar, carbon dioxide would be a waste of that product uh, process, and then a lot of oxygen as they are building new sugar molecules harnessing the sun's energy, turning it into chemical energy. Okay, so in this graph we'll get some data that will answer the question whether plants need all of the colors in white light or only some of them. Here we see on the x-axis we have the different colors of light that were shining on different plants. So one plant was getting violet light, one plant getting blue, one getting green, yellow, orange, red. And here on the y-axis we have rate of photosynthesis from zero to say 100 maximum. They were probably measuring photosynthesis uh, in terms of how much oxygen was being produced. Because remember oxygen is a waste product of photosynthesis, so it's a good measure of photosynthesis happening. So you can definitely see here that with the violet and the blue light, there are high rates of photosynthesis. Also with the reds, high rates of photosynthesis. And you get the valley, you get the lowest rates of photosynthesis with the green and the yellow light. So when white light hits a plant, it looks, especially the leaves, it looks as though uh, the reds and the blues are the colors or the wavelengths of light that are most effective in helping the plant grow. Okay, well, uh, if we ask the question, why is it that plants um, do more photosynthesis under the red and the blue light than the green and the yellow, the answer lies in this molecule right here. It's called chlorophyll. And there are two of them here, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Very similar molecules, so we'll just focus on one of them. These molecules are found on the surface of the chloroplast. And recall the chloroplast uh, is that green disc inside the plant cells. There are many chloroplasts inside the plant cell. Each chlorophyll molecule has a tail region and a head region. The tail, a chain of carbons here with hydrogens stuck on them, this tail is anchored in the membrane of the chloroplast. The head region then uh, sticks up above the membrane and is exposed to light. It is here where light interacts with the molecule in the head region. Well, to examine the properties of chlorophyll, we can use a spectroscope. First of all, if we pass white light into the spectroscope, we will see the colors of the rainbow. So this is a spectroscope, and you look through the device like this, add some light, add some white light for example, and you will see 
bands of color indicating the white light is composed of the colors of, of the rainbow, the colors of the spectrum. Now what we can do then with the spectroscope is to see whether chlorophyll in a test tube like this, whether chlorophyll absorbs any of these colors. And we can detect this by again looking at it through a spectroscope with chlorophyll in front. So white light passes through the chlorophyll into the spectroscope and then we would see whatever colors are present. If chlorophyll absorbs some of the colors, then uh, those colors will be missing in our view. If chlorophyll reflects a color, we will still see that color through the spectroscope. So here's the result of the analysis. Um, here we have a graph showing the absorption of light by chlorophyll A and B. The x-axis then has the different colors of light. The y-axis is percent absorption. So the higher the peak, the more light of that color gets absorbed. Now they have uh, both chlorophyll B and chlorophyll A. Chlorophyll B is the red line, chlorophyll A is the blue line. If we first just focus on chlorophyll A, the blue line, here we see a major peak in the violet color. So chlorophyll A absorbs about maybe 60-70% of the uh, violet light. Here's chlorophyll B has a high peak here in the blue region of the spectrum. So chlorophyll B molecules absorb over 80% of blue light that hits them. And down here in this region of the graph, we see in the red region here, both chlorophyll A and to a lesser extent chlorophyll B absorb in the red region. So in terms of our diagram then, the spectroscope, here we see again the spectroscope with white light passing through it, we would see all the colors of the spectrum. If we pass, or if we put chlorophyll in front of the spectroscope, so we're seeing white light through a tube of chlorophyll, what we see is the blue and the red bands of light disappear. The green remains. We would explain this by saying that the blue and the red light in the white light gets absorbed. It does not ever enter the spectroscope. The molecules of chlorophyll are absorbing those colors of light, those wavelengths of light, while the green wavelengths or colors are uh, being reflected. And so they will be able to pass into the spectroscope and we will see the green band. So now we can see these two important graphs side by side. Here's a common pattern in the two graphs. Here we have the absorption graph showing the absorption characteristics of chlorophyll. And here we have the original graph showing which colors of light produce maximum photosynthesis. If you'll notice the common pattern, the common pattern is in both graphs there is a peak in the red and the blue regions and there's a valley in the green and the yellow. We see that here with the absorption. The chlorophyll molecules are absorbing in the red and absorbing the blues and the violets as well over here, not absorbing the greens and the yellows. Now this common pattern in the two uh, graphs here um, might be a coincidence or not. Of course, biologists argue this is not a coincidence. If we think again about why it is that the, the red and the blue light here produce maximum photosynthesis, the answer seems to be in this graph. The red and blue are precisely the colors of light that are being absorbed by chlorophyll. And the absorption of blue and red light provides energy for the plant to power photosynthesis. Since chlorophyll molecules cannot absorb green light or yellow light, then that energy is not available to be used to make sugar. And so consequently you see the peak over here, photosynthesis rates are low when the plant is illuminated with green and yellow. Again, the explanation for that is that the chlorophyll molecules are not absorbing that light energy, and so it's not available for the plant to make sugar. So in a sense, the pattern we see over here in this graph is explained by the data in this graph. The reason why we get peaks over here in the red and the blue for uh, rates of photosynthesis is because it's the red and blue light that is absorbed and available as an energy source to build sugar. Okay, so here we see a leaf and we see sunlight hitting the leaf. And remember, sunlight is composed of all of the colors of the spectrum. But it turns out 
that because of chlorophyll and its properties of absorption, the fates of the different colors is different. So the red and the blue wavelengths of light are absorbed. The chlorophyll molecules are capturing the energy of those photons of light. Chlorophyll molecules reflect green light. And because green light is reflected in all directions, not just one direction, in all directions, we see the leaf as green. The worst color of light to shine on a plant, if you want it to grow, would be green light. This reflected green light cannot be used as energy to help build sugar. It is the absorbed colors that is providing energy to power photosynthesis. Okay, here we see a very clever experiment done by Engelman to illustrate the relationship between light and photosynthesis in the production of oxygen. What he did was he took a filament, uh, filamentous algae, so it's a it's a green algae that uh, sort of looks like a, a long rod, you know, like a rod like this. Of course, inside the algae there are chloroplasts, and he put these uh, they put the uh, algae in a petri dish, and then passed white light through a prism in such a way that the different regions of the algae were being hit with the different colors of the spectrum. So this region of the algae over here was being illuminated with red light. This region of the algae here was illuminated with the green light. And this region of the algae over here got purple illumination. Now inside the petri dish, he also put some bacteria. And these bacteria cells had two important properties. Number one, they had a little flagellum so they were able to sort of swim around and move. Bacteria, as some species have uh, flagella. Uh, and then also these bacteria need oxygen to survive. So they will tend to move into areas with uh, higher levels of oxygen. It's uh, something they need to be able to metabolize their uh, energy molecules. So when he put the bacteria in the petri dish at the start of the experiment, they were all over the place. After some time, he noticed that the bacteria were gathered around the algae in precisely the areas that were either um, being illuminated with blue light or red light. So here we see the bacteria that are kind of gathered around the part of the algae that's getting red light and blue light. Not many bacteria were found in, uh, near the part of the algae getting green light. So a description of the experiment would be that the bacteria gathered in those parts of the near those parts of the algae that got either blue light or red light. They did not gather near the part that gets green light. That's a description. The explanation has to do with that characteristic of the bacteria that they need oxygen. And so since um, photosynthesis requires an energy source for it to be powered, that energy comes from the sun. We know chlorophyll absorbs only the blues and the reds. And so it's only where the algae is receiving blue or red light that photosynthesis can happen. And when photosynthesis is happening, oxygen is produced as a waste product. That oxygen is what is uh, interesting to the bacteria. And they gather where oxygen levels are high, and they do not gather where oxygen levels are low. The oxygen levels would be low here because this part of the algae is receiving green light. And remember, chlorophyll reflects green light. If, and reflected light cannot be used to power the chemical processes during photosynthesis. So if, if the algae right here is not making sugar, it's also not releasing oxygen. 